Good morning. Welcome to the chapter entitled Environmental and how it plays a role into the real estate transactions. Now, this chapter is a chapter that you are going to either see a lot of in one section, and we'll talk about it, or probably not at all. Uh, this chapter is going to be really big if you get into the commercial side of the deal. Not so much in the residential. I mean, we got a couple areas when we're dealing with lead-based paint and maybe asbestos. But other than that, it's not going to be a lot. And remember, one of your fiduciary duties that we talked about a long time ago was care. Now, so I like to point out here that probably 90% of all the environmental that you will ever get involved with is something like this. Hey, dude. Let's call it environmental company. That could be the extent of your involvement. I mean, you are taking care of your client. If you go, hey, uh, I remember this methyl ethyl death we talked about. Um, I don't remember what it was, but I remember enough to know that you better call an environmental company and let's go from there. And that could be the extent of the care for your client. You are not an environmental engineer. You are not going to be the professional, but what you are going to do is guide them towards that professional. All right. So let's get started and talk about environmental issues in the real estate transaction. So the first thing we need to talk about is the fact that there is an environmental agency out there to help protect the public. It's called the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA. I am sure that you have heard of this by now. It was established in 1970 by President Nixon. And they have most, if not all of the control and the rules and regulations that will come into play in just about every environmental arena that we deal with. There will be some state laws because, as I mentioned earlier in a previous state, remember, a state can be more restrictive, but they can't be less. So some states have their own laws that were modeled after the EPA, but then became a little more strict. So the first environmental topic I want to talk about is this asbestos. Asbestos, believe it or not, is a rock. It is a rock that comes in three forms, and we're not going to get real depth into it, but it was banned in the use of residential products in 1978. It has been sprayed into a lot of the huge commercial buildings because asbestos' big component is that it's fireproof. And you guys have heard of asbestos gloves, asbestos brakes, uh, asbestos fire suits, because the good side to it is, it is fireproof. So there for a long time, it was actually in the building code. Remember that set of engineering standards that required buildings to be sprayed with asbestos so that it would be fire resistant and more, therefore more safe to the public. Well, a couple years later, we went dope and found out that asbestos is very problematic. Asbestos, because it does get into your breathing zone, it will actually cause uh, breathing diseases. The little fibers get wrapped around in your lung. And we can go through all the biology, but I'm sure you guys do not want to hear that. It will become wrapped around the alveoli inside of your lung and constrict it from expanding, which in essence reduces the amount of oxygen intake. So it is very dangerous and it, mic it mimics emphysema. If you've ever seen somebody that has emphysema and they've got that oxygen mask that they wear, very similar to that disease. And because it is what they call friable, this word right here, 
friable means that it's easily crushed. If you guys have seen those ceiling tiles, like in a drop ceiling, you know how easy they break and they can become powder when you like just put a little bit of pressure. That is friable. Asbestos does that. So when it gets disturbed, it actually breaks into little fine fibers that you would breathe into your body. So the key to asbestos is encapsulation, right? Encapsulation. Don't move it. Just rewrap things. And you will see this in the commercial world and in the residential where it's they've got asbestos wrapping around a pipe to insulate it. What you do not want to do is move it. You want to encapsulate it, meaning just put new stuff right over the top. Put a new pipe wrap around it. Uh, another common place was as the mastic, which is glue that would hold flooring down in kitchens, especially in kitchens in the 50s and 60s, like maybe your grandmother's kitchen. Um, and people would go, well, I'm going to put a new floor in. So they would scrape the old floor up. And as they scraped it up, it would break that asbestos bonding that was in that glue and it would become airborne and people would breathe it in. In a case like that, still encapsulation is the most common or best answer because you don't want to move it. So just pour the new floor right over the top. Put the new linoleum right over the top. Another place you might see it, and I grew up in this house. Actually, we had the big, I can't even do it on this screen, um, siding that were asbestos siding. Well, just cover it up. You know, don't take it off to put new vinyl siding in. Just put the vinyl siding right over the top. So make sure you understand that encapsulation is the common method to solve the problem, all right? Just cover it up. Don't disturb it. Now, the most common one that you will be involved with is the lead-based paint. This is the most common residential ha uh, hazard that you will see. And what I want you to do in your book is to go ahead and write, well, I've got the lead-based paint form here. I go ahead and write this date inside it. Let's do this. Move this over to here for a second. And what I want you to do is memorize this date. 1978. That is the date. Any house built after 1978 is free from this form. But any house built 1978 and before is required to have this lead-based paint disclosure form. It is the only federal form that every state uses, all right? And I have told you many times in the past that there's not a lot of questions about forms or things like that. However, here is the one form I actually want to look at so we can talk about. So this form gets completed by the seller and they will give it to the buyer if the buyer is thinking about making an offer because we must, under federal law, disclose the presence of lead-based paint. And this form is called the Disclosure of Information on Lead-Based Paint. But what I want you to see here is in this seller's disclosure, the first letter, A, says, uh, talks about the presence of lead-based paint. And the seller has the option of marking A, or I, the first one, known lead-based paint. Or two, Nahler has no knowledge of lead-based paint. Now, what I want you to see 
is this. This is like a court. When somebody goes to court, the court does not find the person innocent, right? That is not the outcome of a court. The outcome is either guilty or not guilty. And not guilty means that there was insufficient evidence to find the person guilty. They never declare that person innocent. They just say you're not guilty. The same concept lies right here. These two choices either says the seller has knowledge or the seller does not have knowledge of lead-based paint. It doesn't say that there is no lead-based paint in this property. That is not an option. So understand there is a difference. Either I have the knowledge or I have no knowledge. I'm not saying there couldn't be. I'm just saying I don't have the knowledge. And then part B of this would be the associated records that go with part A. So if they have knowledge, then they may have records and reports to prove that knowledge, or they would have no records of that lead-based paint. So typically what you hope your seller marks, and he should mark them honestly, of course, is that he has no knowledge and that he has no records of this, all right? So those are the two first statement that the seller makes when he is listing his house, if the house was built in 1978 or before, this form has to go. Now, the cool thing about this is, if you will notice, there is also a buyer's portion to this. So what happens is when the buyer decides to write the offer, he will have already received this lead-based form and it will be marked up there in the A and the B area. And then the seller is going to initial or mark the fact that he has received the reports or has not received the reports. Now, this form constitutes part of the report. So basically, if the buyer has received the seller's form that is marked, then they have received the, all the reports. It would be just this form, all right? Then the buyer also has to be given this pamphlet, which is put out by the EPA and the Department of Housing and Urban Development that is called Protecting Your Family from Lead-Based or Protecting Your Family from Lead in the Home. It is a form that explains where lead could be and it explains the possible ramifications of the exposure. Now, typically what happens in today's world is most listing agents will have their seller fill this form out if it's required and they will attach it to the listing in the MLS. With the technology we have now, they can attach documents. So when the buyer wants to see the house, they will download this form as part of the viewing so that when they send over the offer, realize they will send the offer to the listing agent and they would send this form where the buyer has marked C1 or C2. He will also mark D, because you, as the selling agent, remember that's the one that works with the buyer, would have given him a copy of this pamphlet. A lot of agents have downloaded this from EPA as a PDF document, absolutely free. You don't have to pay for it. And then most of the time, you would email that document to your buyer client and go, hey, you're going to need this uh, at some point throughout uh, so make sure you read it and understand it. And now here's the, the other part of this. I want to go see. I know it's over here somewhere. Uh, Lead-based paint is not required. Let's go back. 
as the seller, when the seller marks this whole, uh, I have no records and I have no knowledge, I have no knowledge, having knowledge of this is not required. This is the one place where ignorance is bliss. You guys have heard the statement that, you know, ignorance of the law is no excuse. That is entirely true, except right here. 